So welcome to this uh, session on how to fabricate a special tray um, or a custom tray and in this case we're going to be talking about a custom tray uh, for a crown and we will nominate a particular tooth so that we can work to that. Now people quite often ask me um, why our preference is for uh, a custom tray to be made for taking a crown impression and I'd like to just briefly touch on that because um, there, are, there are several options available and lots of practitioners use uh, uh, different techniques. Um, what I'm going to suggest here is that uh, after being uh, in a laboratory for as long as I have, over 40 years, and, and uh, seeing all manner of impressions come into the laboratory, the most consistent results that we see are for impressions that are taken with a custom tray. Now that's not to say that other systems don't work and we can talk about those perhaps at a later date and how they might be most effective uh, in working but the custom tray would be the starting point particularly for those people who are doing uh, small amounts of this work or who are uh, wanting to get a, a consistent result. So I'm going to run through how we would fabricate a custom tray in our laboratory um, so that people who decide to fabricate their own custom trays for Crown and Bridge can uh, have a look at that and if they want to make a custom tray this might be a method that they would use to achieve a consistent result with the tray. So let's start with our, with our model. In this case I'm going to use this lower dentate model. It's just a practice model and we're going to be doing the crown on the 4-6, okay? And the first thing that we're going to do is to outline where our tray is going to go so that we can fabricate uh, the border of the tray exactly to the, that outline. We don't need to have a large tray for Crown and Bridge. In fact, it's counterproductive both in the cost of material that might be used to take the impression and also in the cumbersomeness of the tray when we're getting to the end of that long appointment when the patient's had their mouth open and, uh, and you're going to take a tray uh, and, and place it in their mouth after you've done the retraction and so on, then we need a tray to be just enough to capture the occlusal surface of all of the teeth and particularly the gingival area around the nominated tooth that we're going to be uh, cutting the prep on. So in this case, it's this tooth here. So the general rule would be for our tray to extend about four millimetres below the gingiva in that area. So let's look at that distance there. And it's both on the buckle and on the lingual side, about four millimetres below the gingiva. Okay, that's just to ensure that we have nice coverage around that area and we're going to capture the margins of that tooth that have been retracted and so on. Because remember that we don't want this patient to go through multiple impression takings if we can avoid that because it's uncomfortable for a patient at the end of, of a long procedure. So we then go to one tooth either side, the abutment tooth either side, and about halfway uh, is where the, the periphery of the, of the tray is going to come up to being about a millimetre and a half over the gingiva. So we're just sweeping that down to the four millimetre position and then we have the abutment tooth here and it's just gradually sweeping up to be about one and a half to two millimetres below the gingiva and then we progress that around the whole of the, of the arch at that distance below the gingiva. Okay, so it's just a little bit below that distance when we get to the preparation but everywhere else is just going over the gingiva by about this much. So that way we get this tray to actually guide itself into position over the teeth because it's going down that small amount over the gingiva. When we place it in the mouth it's going to guide itself down and you'll see the reason why that's significant in a moment when we're placing the tissue stops to which we, uh, the distance we will seat the tray. Okay, so you can see me coming up to that pre-marked area there. So we're going to, from the halfway through the abutment tooth, we're going to just sweep it down like that and then sweep it up again in, in this manner here. Okay, so now we have the outline complete all the way around the model. We're going to look at the tissue stops. So we might just pause here and, and people would ask, why are we going for the full arch? Because quite often in a dental laboratory, we return just the quarto impression, which is a technique that has been uh, put forward by people. And it certainly is convenient 
to take a, a, a cordae tray and take upper and lower impression at the same time. For us in the laboratory, it's a real drama because we don't have any successful way of actually creating the occlusal slides if we don't have the balancing side of the arch, both in our antagonist, our opposing model, and in the existing impression. It does help enormously for us to have this, for us to get a balanced occlusion and to avoid the adjustments that need to be made to crowns when we can't achieve that. If you can picture, if we just have the cordo, this uh, rotation can be anywhere and we don't know if there's canine guidance on either side. So if you, again, if we want to maximise the consistent result, we would try to get all of the arch into every impression and that's why we're limiting the size of the tray so it's easy for us to, to do that. So once we have done that and before we place the spacer on, we're going to select where we, we're going to place our tissue stops because the idea is we want a couple of areas where the tray is going to rest on teeth uh, so that it maintains the space of the, that we provide for the impression material. So the general rule is that obviously we're not going to place it where the prep is because that tooth is going to be cut down, but we're going to place it in four spots in the arch that are wide apart and to the outside so that we get this effect of the tray being seated positively and not having rotation points. So we always go for four points here. We're going to go for this buckle cusp of, of the seven, the four seven, and then I'm going to go to the canine right here because that's the corner of the arch, the canine here, corner of the arch, and then we're going to go for the buccal cusp right here. So if you have other teeth missing and so on, you're going to choose the points that are, are furthest apart because it's just simply like a chair. If you have the legs nice and wide apart at the four corners of the chair, when you sit on it, it's nice and stable. If we had one of these legs over here and you sat on this part, well then the chair is going to collapse. It's the same with the tray. We want to be able to seat that tray positively so it engages there. The reason that we choose the cusps for us to seat this on is that when the tray is coming down, if we had chosen a central fossa to put the rest in, the tissue stop in, and we have the tray a little bit left or right, that tissue stop will seat on a cusp and then not let the tray seat all the way home. And so we're going to have a variation in the thickness of our impression material and that leads to some uh, distortion in where the thick areas set faster than the thin areas and so on. And we get little stresses incurred and that can lead to some distortion in the impression. So we want to get this tray to positively seat and if it's on the cusp, it's the last thing to contact the tooth. It can't contact prematurely on a cusp um, and we get a nice seating of that. So that's why we always put them onto cusps, not into, into grooves on the teeth. So once we've got the outline like so, we're going to take our wax and we're going to create the space. Now, there are lots of theories about um, the, the space in this and we need to look at, again, the consistent result. Usually with crown and bridge material, we want to just fill the undercuts and then leave the spa a consistent space of one layer of wax. Um, two layers of wax is too much. One layer we find after we fill the obvious undercuts is the perfect result. We get a consistent result of economy of material and yet we are able to take this out of the mouth comfortably and we are able to pour the model and function with that in the laboratory sense uh, um, uh, accurately pouring models. Okay, So simply we take some standard wax and there's no great science to this. All we're going to do is heat the wax and fill up the obvious undercuts in in our model like so. So we're just going to run around and fill these. And if you get your wax hot enough, it will flow and fill those uh, areas quite, quite easily because it's finding its own level and filling the undercut, okay? And we don't need to get caught up in the neatness of this because it really it's only a spacing material for the impression um, uh, to provide a space for the impression material and to allow it to flex out of undercuts. 
Now, if there are retroclined or proclined teeth across the arch, obviously we're going to apply a little bit more than less so that we don't have a problem with taking this out of the mouth because some of the pressure materials can be quite resistant to tearing through the interproximal and we don't want to put the patient through unnecessary trauma. So if there are uh, uh, undercuts are a little bit more excessive than the standard um, that, that you're seeing on this model, then you're going to fill them a little bit more than, than you would if it's just a standard model. But for the purpose of this exercise, you can just see that I'm applying this, this wax to fill up the undercut. This method that I'm teaching um, is one that can be used by uh, people who have very little experience at uh, creating special trays and they can end up with a very, very good result um, and leading to consistent results with impression taking. Okay, so now we can see that I've just filled the undercuts like that in the proximal areas. Now I'm going to take my sheet of wax and I'm going to adapt one sheet of wax to this model. This is just standard modelling wax. You could use a uh, Byton uh, boxing wax, which is slightly softer. Um, in the end, uh, my decision on using modelling wax is that modelling wax is a little bit more resistant to pushing thin because the idea of this uh, layer here is to provide a consistent thickness of the spacer so that we have a consistent thickness of the impression material. You can see how I just tore that basically up the center and now I'm just going to make sure it's adapted over my line. I don't want to press this thin in any area. I want it to maintain its millimeter and a half uh, thickness of material, but you notice how I'm adapting it to the line that I've drawn all the way around. Okay, I find using the thicker part of your thumb and laying your finger along the best way to adapt. If we use the tips of our fingers, we can tend to push this nice and, uh, and thin in areas and then we get an inconsistency. So you can see how we've adapted that and particularly pay attention to adapting it around this area at the back of the last tooth in the arch so that we can capture that uh, that whole surface and particularly if your crown prep is on the last one of course we need that tray to wrap right over that area okay so now it's adapted to the line we can see the line clearly all the way around it's not flared out so that your tray flares out at the edge it's adapted right to the line all the way around we're then going to take a hot instrument just lightly hot and we're going to cut it to that line all the way around. Now I'm using a a thermo wax, uh, wax knife heater here, but this works equally as well with a Bunsen burner for those um, situations where only a Bunsen burner is available. It's exactly the same procedure, just lightly heating your knife and, um, and going around and cutting this off like so. Okay, I like to then just go around and remove the little beveled or knurled edge that's turned up by the cutting process. It's just a fine edge. And when I do that, I'm looking for areas where the wax folded over itself, and I just remove one of the thicknesses of that wax. So in one or two places where the wax folded over itself, you're just going to make it back, take it back to the one thickness, taking that little sharp edge off. You might notice that I'm not rounding the edge, I want this edge to be nice and sharp, a right angle, so that it marks my tray material so I know exactly where to trim my uh, tray when I adapt it. Okay? Just going to make sure that this little bit 
fold here where it wrapped around that tooth is nice and even. You can see that little edge that's been curled up by the wax. I'm just taking that off at 90 degrees to the cut that I've made. So do take note of the fact that the cut was made perpendicular to the surface all the way around. I didn't cut it on this angle down like that. We don't want the tray to taper in. We want it actually for the material to be able to flow past the edge of the of the periphery of the tray freely because we no longer have the rim lock trays like we did with the old rubber based impression materials where the, we required some compression. Now uh, we prefer these materials to flow freely and then for the tray to be held in place while they set. So you can see through the tray now where my uh, tissue stops are. I'm going to cut these vertically and the reason I, I'm going to do that is so that if you can picture the impression material is going to be just like this wax. It's going to come up and then it's going to finish hard against the edge of that um, uh, vertical surface. So we have impression material that's meeting the tissue stop in a strong sense. It's not tapering off into a fine edge that's likely to live. So we get nice strong uh, material right up to these tissue stops. Okay, so resist laying this over on an angle. We're cutting it just vertically down like so and our tray material will go into that down and touch the tooth. Don't be scared to make these cover the whole of that cusp. We, too often we see beautifully constructed trays that have a pinpoint uh, contact with the tooth uh, which must be awfully difficult for the practitioner to to seat accurately in the mouth at that stage where the patients had their mouth open now for an hour and um, they're, um, they're kind of keen to get out of the out of the surgery. We want to make sure that this process is seamless and uh, and efficient and all done in one case. So there we have the tissue stops. So this tray is going to seat on those nicely and it'll be a very positive fit. So we're ready now to adapt our um, tray material and, and, uh, and handle. Okay, so the choice of uh, tray material is really up to uh, the person making the tray, but I'm suggesting that uh, the uh, acrylic trays, which are uh, obviously mixing monomer and uh, polymer together and then uh, adapting it, uh, is more difficult for uh, practitioners who are making occasional trays. So I'm going to suggest that the most economic way uh, for someone to make a tray in a surgery situation where there are occasional trays made would be to go with a light cure uh, resin. Slightly more expensive, but a, a lot easier to manage and uh, not as technique sensitive. Um, in, in our laboratories, we make uh, acrylic trays because the material is more robust for, for transport. It, it's not as, as brittle but we are making lots and lots of these so that we can uh, that we're confident and comfortable with with adapting them in you know in the short setting time that you have for that material so we're going to make one with the light cured material the technique would be the same I and mean, then you have to you've got all the time in the world this with this material there's a, all manner of uh, these materials on the market you can source them from most dental companies um, this particular one uh, has a pink color but, but uh, there are lots of different colours that, uh, that are put out by different companies. So we're going to make this tray in this uh, uh, to adapt it. I actually like to use the uh, uh, to buy the upper blanks only, not the lower for, for this purpose because we can use the bit that we cut out for our handle and we can get the, a, a nice uh, um, a solid handle with uh, adapting our tray. With some of the lower blanks you don't quite get enough material to make the handle as well and you're, and you're using more than one blank. So the first thing that I'm going to do is just take a small amount of this and place it into each of these tissue stops. So just enough to fill those up and if we just take it off the corner here, we're going to fill those tissue stops up. Now, once again, I'm going to place this little cut in here so that this material doesn't stretch because we want it to remain thick and strong if we possibly can. So now, 
we're going to just let this under its own weight more or less droop onto our tray surface and we're going to position it so that the periphery comes down to that margin all the way around. Now we don't want it to fold so if we gently massage it like this well then it's going to come down to the periphery and we're not going to push a thin spot in the tray material everywhere. I like to use this nice big smooth part of my hand to do this and gradually this tray material particularly if you've had it in the fridge and it starts to starts to warm and so on it will settle down nicely and we'll end up with a nice consistent thickness over the whole of the tray without pushing a thin spot. Now where we know our, our uh, tissue stops are we're just going to press and make sure that we make contact with that material below there because that will make sure that we have our tissue stops are bonded to the uh, tray body. Now remember the trick with adapting the wax around the back of these teeth, we're going to do the same here. Hold it there and just make sure that you adapt it without pushing it thin in any one area. Can you notice how this material now is conforming and wrapping around without pushing any thin areas into the, into the tray? We've got to resist that because this material can be a little bit brittle in its nature and that we want it to be um, a consistent thickness so that we don't end up with any problems with it breaking during the procedures of taking the impression or if someone's um, going through the sterilizing process with it and so on when they might bump it. We want it to be uh, effective and, and solid. So if we have an area like that where we're a little bit short of that periphery I'm just going to press it up here and then work it down over a long area and we don't get any thin spots but it comes down to that periphery and it remains quite thick at that periphery. We don't push it uh, into a thin area. Okay? Then we're simply going to go around and we're going to cut it back to our wax all the way around. Now I'm using a pink um, material here. If we had a different coloured material, you could, of course can see the pink wax through there a lot more clearly and you'd find this trimming process would be a lot easier for you. But it's still not too difficult, uh, even when it's pink. You can see enough of it to take off that material. Now I like to think that we would spend uh, uh, time making these look neat because uh, these patients are going through quite a bit of time in the chair and they're usually paying um, uh, quite a bit of money for the procedure. So the more professional we can make these trays uh, um, look in, in appearance, uh, the more likely the patients are to be given the idea of professionalism and quality from um, uh, from the practitioner. So it's worth taking that bit of extra time and we certainly do to try and make sure that our trays are finished neatly and give so that our um, clients can give off that professional um, uh, aura to their, to their work by presenting a tray that's nice and neat. Then we have a handle like this. I'm, I've got a little bit less than what I would like there, so I am going to take a little bit from another blank and add to this so that I've got a handle that's a little bit more solid than what that we, we have. And that really depends on the size of the, of the mouth and, and, um, and how much of the arch you're covering with your impression. But we take the, the handle and we shape it to basically the size that you are used to using. I, the general rule would be that we would shape it to the size of the thumb like so and then we've got it thick at this end here. A little trick that I use is to go around and now squeeze this out all the way around like so into a thin stage like that. And that means that when we now position this on there we have this large surface area of bonding 
and so the tray is bonded strongly, uh, the handle is bonded strongly to the tray. So we sit that on there now and it minimises the amount of blending that we have to do. So I'm going to line that up right on the midline there because that helps with the positioning of the tray. If we have it on the midline we always get it in the right spot and straight over the top of the teeth. And at this stage I do not try to position the handle at all. All I'm doing now is spending the time to blend this handle in like so and get the perfect join, seamless join onto the, the tray. You can see how that's occurring and the handle's not flopping or moving at all. It's in exactly the right position. And I can blend this handle in perfectly. All of that before I do any positioning of the handle to come out of the mouth. Now I'm using a slight dragging and pressing action in together here to get this. If we press too hard, of course, we're going to thin the, the periphery out in, in that area. We don't want that to occur. And if you get a little white area like this where there's a bit of air incorporated, if you just press it with the end of the finger a few times, it, it starts to blend that colour in. Okay? A little bit of something in the tray there. We'll take that off and then we'll blend that handle in. Okay, once I'm happy with the shape of that, then I'm going to take this and remember that this is a dentate model. The lip is going to be sitting about there at the height of the teeth, coincidental with the incisal edge of the teeth. So we need this handle just to clear those teeth and to come out like so. And we would like the handle to be parallel to the occlusal plane because that way we know it's coming straight out of the mouth. We don't want it to be poking up like that and interfering with the upper teeth. We just want it to come straight out of the mouth so that the, the thumb can grip that and, uh, and manoeuvre it because quite often it's quite difficult to remove those impressions, particularly where there's interproximal areas where the impression material has seeded in there. Okay, so there's our handle and the shape of the handle like so. We can do a lot more here in, in smoothing this up. It depends on your requirements in surgery. Just blending this in. And now it's ready for us to go into the light curing unit. We might, if you want to get a better finish, you might take a little bit of Vaseline and use a small amount of Vaseline and then smooth it like so and that will give you a slight sheen to that and when it's cured we will end up with quite a smooth quite a smooth area okay so now we're ready to go to the light curing unit and cure this tray so now we've been over our tray and smoothed it effectively with a little bit of uh, vaseline i'm going to place it into the light curing unit and we need to cure that to the specifications of the manufacturer in this case we're going to do a minute and a half on that side and then we will uh, remove the tray with the wax still inside it off the model and we will cure it from the inside for another minute and that should cure the tissue stops in the thicker areas of the handle and so on so that we can then uh, just finish the tray off ready for use in the surgery. Okay so we've uh, now taken the uh, a tray off we've turned it over and we've cured for another minute on the inside like so and we're ready now to take the uh, wax spacer out of the tray so we're just going to go around and lift that out and hopefully it will come out in one piece particularly if it's the tray is just still a little bit warm from being under the light and you'll see now that we've got these tissue stops that are nicely cured because we reversed uh, the curing, lifting out all traces of the wax. And we end up with a tray that's finished like that. Now it's a simple process now for us to just go around and remove any little sharp edges of that tray and we have a nice smoothly finished tray like so and that's quite presentable and can be easily constructed in any dental surgery using this light material. So I'll just run around the periphery so that we can see exactly how we would do that. Just 
just using a standard cross cut flame shape there. I'm just making sure that this periphery is presenting with a nice smooth rounded edge because this is going up into the mucobuckle fold area in lots of cases and, and I have a soft tissue that's very sensitive and sometimes very dry at the end of this uh, procedure that the patient has been through so it's nice to have this nicely smooth. We don't want to thin the periphery down at all, we're just taking off all of the sharp edges so we don't have it hurting the patient. Doing this we try not to go up over the surface and change the colour of that material because then you would have to make the tray a uniform colour. So now we have that nice smooth periphery. I'm just checking that. I like to check that with my little finger because that will show up any areas that are um, a little bit sharp. My little finger is um, infinitely more sensitive than all my other fingers <laughs> because it's hardly ever used. Now we're going to place that back on here just to make sure that it's going down to that line all the way around and you can see that when we place this in on here we get a nice positive setting of that on, onto those uh, tissue stops. Okay, handle is nice and rigid, a uh, nice strong bond to here so if you're placing extra pressure on this to take it uh, out of the mouth we can do that. We've limited uh, the amount of material that's going to be here by having the tissue stops in there so it does make this easier to take out than if we had a tray that covered more of the area okay but there's enough there for us to know that we've got a positive uh, seating of the tray so there is the uh, crown and bridge tray for a single crown on the three uh, or the four six